The Cemetery for All the Mothers Who Died Way Too Young by Mark Gallarita Read by Cliff Winnig I picked up my first job as an assistant groundskeeper at a cemetery for mothers from my classmate, Heidi Arthur. She heard my mom died of lupus over summer break and that I needed a job to help my dad with funeral bills. That sucks, dude, she said to me during lunch. She surrounded herself with death all the time, so she was used to it. That and her father died when she was in middle school. Drunk driving, his fault. Hey, you're 16, right? She asked, and I nodded. Cool, well, two things. Are you free most weeknights and weekends? And can you work long hours without dying of dehydration? Her question was really four when you think about it, but I said yes and no. I had no money and nothing else going on my sophomore year, so I applied, interviewed with Mrs. Arthur, and got in. The trouble with being a groundskeeper wasn't so much the exterior maintenance like lawn upkeep or all the funerals. Problem was the routine. Recently deceased mothers habitually left their grave plots, or urns, as glowing, ethereal beings whose sole mission was to journey back to where they died or go back home, wherever home was. A chunk of my responsibilities involved wrangling them from all over New Jersey and back to the graveyard with Heidi and the other groundskeepers. It wasn't the best job, but at least it was something better to do than fart around the Wawa parking lot after school or think about my mom. Mrs. Arthur kind of hinted at the job responsibilities early on. Our clients aren't always the most compliant, she said during the tour. Besides making sure that their new homes are maintained, it is our priority to ensure our clients are not only given a proper resting place for eternity, but that they stay there. I thought she was using the same marketing buzzwords she used to sell people on her peaceful matron meadows cemetery. So at the time, I ignored it. Proper. Home. Eternity. Stay. She wasn't kidding. Her clients would flee the grounds as floating spectrals, their bright blue or white bodies glowing, leaving a trail of an even brighter cloud, as if they were followed by a haunted house fog machine. Family members, religious folk, or even cops would call Mrs. Arthur's Cemetery, and she'd send us out to pick him up. To be honest, I wouldn't have kept the job if Heidi wasn't there. I worked with her and another groundskeeper, Ernie, who taught me how to bring the ethereal clients back. Between the two of them, they had a whole slew of platitudes and nicknames for things on the job. Smart way to approach a floater is to remember where they're at and where you are. The key is to work smarter, not harder. Wrangle them in with kindness. Don't fake it. The moment you do, they'll realize what you're trying to do and fuck right off. Display in true sincerity paves a long way to success in life. It's true with floaters. It's true with life. Be mindful. Stay in your lane. To bring back a client-slash-floater required the following tools. One generator the size of an air conditioning unit that you had to handle with both hands. A vacuum the size of check-in luggage that you either strapped to your back or carried like a briefcase, complete with a suction rod attachment for the vacuum. A cleaning bag to store them. And the nerve to lug this shit around for a very long time. That's two people so far who are lugging these heavy bastards. Third person's got the hardest position by far. The one who has to talk to the client. Some might think it's tough to talk to someone who shouldn't be around anymore. Gets easier, though. Ernie said that it either had to be Heidi or me that talked to them, because floaters enjoy looking at young people. It reminds them of the kids they once had. They called this part of the job... A bag and tag. Now the trick is you gotta ease into it, Heidi said as she pulled the string to fire up the generator. 
My first bag and tag was to bring back Mrs. Linda Galang. We found her meandering through a former 7-Eleven parking lot that her husband used to own, until he sold it off and it became a Wawa. They think that they're still alive and have that one last chance to say goodbye to someone. You ever talk to a kid before? Try to get him to calm down? No? How about when someone was mad at you for something you know you did wrong? Okay, good. Stick with that feeling. Tell Linda to focus. It's going to be okay. Don't do it enough to insult their intelligence. And don't call her a client or a floater. Good. You're doing well. Tell them where they are. You remember the profile on her? How she died? Car accident on Interstate 295 heading north? She was caved in by a semi-truck? Sad, but hey, that's the brakes. Let her know this. Bring her back to reality. She shouldn't be here. Wait, stop. You're scaring her. She's going to disappear again. Ernie, go around with the gear. Dude's going to lose her. Hey, dude, dude. Hey, hey, listen. Repeat after me. What happened to her sucked. Life hasn't given her a fair shot at things, but she's always been a good mother. She's got good kids and a good husband, and they all love her. They're doing okay, but it's been over two years since she passed. They've all moved on. She needs to move on, too. Live in the afterlife. Emphasis, afterlife. Good work. All right, Ernie, bag her. And that's how it goes. Ernie pulled the switch, and the vacuum sucked the mother into a cleaning bag that we threw into the truck. She was 49 when she passed on with two kids and a husband from North Jersey. Same age when my mother left, too. When we got back to the graveyard in the early morning, we let the floater loose in front of her gravestone. Her spirit rose out slowly, like the heat released from a microwaved bag of popcorn. We watched her body roam for a while before re-entering into the ground. I never saw her again, or at least not while I was still working there. That first morning, I watched the sun rise into a faint orange glow for the first time, just above the cemetery's sycamore trees. Ernie stood next to me with the client gear in hand, while Heidi leaned against the driver's side door, staring at one of the graves. Did you mean all of that? I asked her. To the client? About life and death and all that? It was something. Heidi scoffed. Hey, what do you want to believe, dude? There were other groundskeepers, of course, except I never worked with them, and they never stuck around for more than a few weeks before moving on without notice. Couldn't blame them. Being a groundskeeper was not an easy job. It's hard to find reliable people who are able to do arduous minutiae without daily external affirmation of value. After three weeks of working with clients, I started seeing them everywhere, in my sleep, during class, hovering across from me on the bus ride back home. All I could think about were the many floater bodies in flux, formally living mothers dressed in colorful formal wear, sluggishly floating along the side of the road or parking lot, silent mothers trying to reach out for a loved one to hear them, their voices trying to call out a name that does not call back. I brought back mothers hovering outside the lawns of their former homes, long auctioned off or abandoned. Mothers who roamed the scene of accidents where they died, roaming in circles hoping for a different result or a chance to go back. Mothers, 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 everywhere. I turned to my dad to relieve my anxiety, but he dismissed it as first job jitters. His first real job was at an oil field as a young Philippine migrant. I tried to tell him it was not the same, and he figured I was being a spoiled American. Life is tough all around for everyone, he said to me. I could have gone back and forth with him, but it got him talking again, so I listened. 
Since Mom died, he didn't talk about anything beyond pointing to things he needed to survive, like medicine or beer. Your mother was tough, he told me. If she were here, she'd tell you to wise up. Endure it. I couldn't imagine her saying that. My mom was a quiet woman who, unless prompted to, wouldn't give me life advice or warn me about anything. Like my dad, they both carried about their days preparing me for school, making sure I had something to eat, going to work, providing shelter. Between the two of them, it had become clear to me that every day was a matter of getting through to the next one. The necessities of maintaining a home, a life, a child. They worked four or five jobs between them, mostly odd stuff. My childhood and early teen years were a series of moving pieces, two parents trying to make this plot of land their own, whatever that meant. If I did the same and made something of myself, perhaps I would have a relationship with them too, once I could afford my own place, I assumed. But... Mom passed from a disease that had been haunting her all her life. I never got the chance to talk to her and really talk. A chance to memorize the cadence of her voice. Study how she moved. Consider the way she smiled. I tried to recall a collection of small moments that could be called her life. Yet, as fast as I could recall them, they disappeared. Puffed away in cinder and smoke. Think of the clients as if they're in purgatory when they leave the place, Heidi told me, en route to another job. They get buried here and become clients. There's a ceremony for them, blah, blah, blah. Whatever the paying family wants. On the other hand, what does the client want? What if they realize that whatever they're seeing on the other side isn't worth much? And what they had here, in their old lives, is worth going back to. Sort through unfinished business and the like, Ernie said as he drove. I nodded, impersonating a person who understands things easily. We could spitball all day and try to figure out why the clients kept leaving, she continued. Believe me, we all tried. Even hired poltergeist folk from nine different religions to help us. No dice. I can't tell you with 100% certainty why they leave. Then again, I can tell you it's probably because they're not happy with where they ended up in life. Although it is where they ended up. It's life, you know? You look online for help in the, uh, cemetery community? I asked. Others who have similar problems? Sometimes they come back on their own. Sometimes they stay where they're at. It's all about finding what makes them happy, I suppose. She slapped my shoulder playfully. Like how you and I both lost parents. They weren't perfect, so what? Doesn't mean we stop living our lives how we want, right? I found my mom levitating along Route 295 while on the job. I knew it was her, because she was in the one red dress she wore only for special occasions. The one Dad chose for her casket. Stop the van, I yelled at Ernie. What you see, Heidi said as he slowed down. I told her what I saw. She's not one of ours, though. Keep going, Ernie. We have to stay in our lane. I protested again, but they wouldn't have it. I watched the floater, no, my mother, disappear, moving forward, not knowing where she was going. You ever heard of mindfulness? she asked. I shook my head. It's a fancy word that people throw around a lot. It means the world telling the world to fuck off, trying not to overthink things too much. Minding your business and controlling what you can control. Staying in your lane, Ernie added. You do this yourself? I asked. She spoke of the time freshman year when she tried out for the varsity field hockey team. One of the girls gunning for the captain's spot corralled the others into bullying her. 
Rather than take her out with a stick, which Heidi fantasized, she fought harder for the spot, and she ended up getting it. However, she quit to work at the cemetery. The whole situation pissed me off, but, you know, when I really thought about it, I realized what was important to me. Dude, think about what actions you want to take, and the actions you can take right now. What would happen if you did them? And what if you didn't? It's a lot to sort through, but it helps. It helped me cope with Dad. The thought of thinking moment by moment stressed me out at first. I put Heidi's words to use, though, trying to remain in the moment and remember what I saw every day. From my first class at school to the moment I clocked in at work, took a break, or at the very second I was talking to a client so that Ernie could suck him into the vacuum. What I could control was how I handled the work I was given, and if I found my mother's floating spirit again, what I would say. So long as it wasn't on company time, of course. On nights off, I visited the cemetery near my house where we placed Mom's urn. It was the sort of place where they kept all kinds of folk in one spot. No animals, though. I visited Mom that first year as often as I could. I switched out Mom's sunflowers for fresh ones, said a prayer or three, and sometimes I talked to her even though she never said anything back. It felt silly at first, but life is silly too. She and my dad spent their whole lives trying to maintain a roof over our heads and three meals a day. Look where it got her, and look where it got me. The practice of minding my own business and sorting out things in my head didn't last after two months. I stopped seeing other clients when I was talking to them. Instead, I started seeing her. My monologues got all mixed up, and sometimes I was just yelling at people. Crying, really. Heidi and Ernie let me slip a few times, but after a week of me being on edge, Heidi pulled me aside after I almost let a client get away. Do you need to go home, dude? Heidi said. Because you're dragging ass right now. So I told her. I had to. I told her about Mom and going to her urn and never seeing her again. I told her that maybe she was out there right now, and I wasn't looking for her hard enough. Maybe she didn't want to find me, but wanted to find herself or something to that effect. Why else would I see her on 295 and not at the cemetery near her house where she should be? It didn't make sense. Heidi nodded and went back into the van. When I kept standing there, she turned around. Well, come on now, dude. Let's find her. We drove for two hours up and down Jersey with no luck. We skipped out on the rumors or sightings of clients roaming throughout the night, all to find my mom. Ernie didn't feel too good about what we were doing, but Heidi promised him overtime, and that shut down any descent real quick. We started by retracing the route along I-295 where I'd first seen her. Then, to her old jobs, since she was never at one place for more than two years. Then we went for other places she might be. The old church we no longer go to, the Catholic elementary school that cost too much money, then the cemetery itself. Nothing. We didn't see her again until near dawn, outside a Wawa parking lot where my preschool used to be. That her? Heidi pointed at my mother hovering an inch above the parking lot pavement. We found her in the same outfit, her body ethereal, a cerulean blue. She was floating, wandering in circles, never looking or pointing to anyone in particular. Yeah, that's her. What do you want to do? Ernie asked me. Heidi looked at me. You just want to talk, right, dude? I couldn't get out what I wanted to say. My chest squeezed itself shut, like it was being pulled down to my seat in the van, even as Heidi recited platitudes in my ear. Mindfulness, she kept saying. Mindfulness and being in the moment. Go and put yourself at rest for once, I heard her say. 
A clunker van pulled into the parking lot, black smog gassing out from the tailpipe. Two women in overalls popped out the front, followed by a boy of about my age. Didn't recognize him. They took out the same equipment we had, and it took a minute, but Ernie approached the woman and shook hands with her. They were the groundskeepers from the cemetery near my house. Ernie stuck his head out and hollered at one of the women who hustled over quickly. Her name was Siomara. Our dude back here, Ernie said, pointing to me, says that float over there is his mama. That's so, Siomara said and looked at me. She's been gone for a minute. We've been looking all over for her. Every time we got a tip from someone, she'd disappear and be off somewhere else. If you want to talk to her, be quick about it. We got to take her home. They all turned to me, expecting an answer, and when they got none, Heidi pushed me out of the van and dragged me over. What could I say to my mother? I'm sorry. I'm sorry I never took the time to open up and ask you to talk about yourself. I'm very thankful to you for providing for me, raising me, making sure I ate and slept every day. However, I feel like I don't know you. My mother came to a stop in front of me. When she looked at me with her glowing, big blue eyes, I said hello. Then I said it again, and again, and again, and again. She didn't say anything. Heidi squeezed my arm. Not how you imagined? No, not really. Remember what I said about mindfulness? Good. Look at her. Now look at where you are. Say to her what you have to say. So I did. I looked right at her and I said what I said. I fumbled a bit, but after a while I got the hang of it. You good? Heidi said. Yeah, I said. Yeah, I'm good. At Heidi's signal, the crew from the other cemetery bagged and tagged my mother and left. When I stopped crying, we left too. I visited my mom's grave a few more times after that. Sometimes I'd wait until closing time for her to pop out of her resting place, hoping she'd turn up like one of the lost mothers from work trying to escape. She never did, though. School picked up, and the balancing act of life got even harder. There were boyfriends and girlfriends, new friendships that came and fizzled out, and standardized tests I had to practice for. Once I moved to the Midwest for college, I didn't go back. Not even when I visited Dad for Christmas. I stayed at Mrs. Arthur's Cemetery as long as Heidi worked there. Ernie was all right, but I enjoyed work when she was around. We stopped communicating after a few years. No ill will. It was just that she got a boyfriend who was itching to become a state trooper. She started to hang out only with his cop friends. So I don't really know how the peaceful matron Meadows is doing. It's still there if you look for it. I ended up getting a job at a Wawa near our school a few months later. It wasn't real work. The hours were better, though. You've just listened to The Cemetery for All the Mothers Who Died Way Too Young by Mark Gallerita. This story was read to you by Cliff Winnig. Mark Gallerita's writing can be found in McSweeney's, Electric Literature, Split Lip, The Wrath Bearing Tree, and elsewhere. His play, Manny Pacquiao Punches the World But the Earth Doesn't Even Flinch, was a finalist in the 2020 Arts in the Armed Forces contest, judged by David Henry Wang, and the 2021 44th Annual Bay Area Playwrights Festival. Previously, he was the editor-in-chief of the Wittig award-winning journal, The Black Warrior Review. He is a graduate of the 2017 Clarion West Writers' Workshop and the University of Alabama MFA program where he was a McNair Fellow and a recipient of the Don F. Hendry Jr. Short Story Prize. 
Cliff Winnig writes science fiction, fantasy, and horror. His short fiction has appeared on the Escape Pod podcast and in magazines and anthologies, including Mad Scientist Journal, Footprints, Hadley Rill Books, and Straight Out of Deadwood, Bane Books. He is a graduate of the Clarion Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Workshop. When not writing, Cliff plays sitar, studies Aikido and Tai Chi, sings in two different choirs, and does social dance, including ballroom, swing, and Argentine tango. He lives with his family in Silicon Valley, which constantly inspires him to think about the future. He can be found online at cliffwinnig.com. To find out more about Many Worlds, check us out at manyworldsforum.com. Thank you for listening to Many Worlds. Worlds.